10 years ago in the small East African country of Rwanda, 800,000 people were slaughtered by their own government. This was ordinary men, women, and children, and the only reason that they were killed was because they were Tutsi. Virtually the entire world turned away and did almost nothing to stop the genocide. In retrospect, it all looks very clear, but at the time, what was happening in Rwanda, the situation was unclear. They cannot tell me that they didn't know. Everybody knew what was happening. Tonight on Frontline, the full story of perhaps the darkest and most brutal tragedy of our time. It is a story told by the victims and by the killers, by those who turned away and by those who stayed and tried desperately to save as many people as they could. By the time the genocide was over, I was so angry at America. America the beautiful, America the brave. They are all still haunted by what happened. I was the commander and hundreds of thousands of people died. I can't find any solace in statements like I did my best. Still haunted by the ghosts of Rwanda. Rwanda will never, ever leave me. It's in the pores of my body. My soul is on the, in those hills. My spirit is with the spirits of all those people who were slaughtered and killed that I know of. And lots of those eyes still haunt me. Angry eyes or innocent eyes. No laughing eyes. But the worst eyes that haunt me are the eyes of those people were totally bewildered. They're looking at me with my blueberry, and they're saying, what in the hell happened? How come I'm dying here? Those eyes dominated, and they're absolutely right. How come I failed? How come my mission failed? How come, as the commander, I did not convince, I lost soldiers, and 800,000 people died? General Romeo Dallaire, commander of the United Nations Assistance Mission for Rwanda. It was his first trip to Africa. You know, the first breath of air of, of uh, Africa. Oh, what a, what a phenomenal experience. It, 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 it felt like you were in another continent. You were, you were, it was different. Felt a little nervousness, of course, you know, of uh, the first shaking hands uh, with, uh, with those uh, leaders uh, and starting up the mission. For Dallaire, a Canadian general who had never seen action, this was the command of a lifetime, a UN peacekeeping mission in the heart of Africa. His job seemed simple. He would enforce a peace agreement between the Rwandan government in Kigali and a rebel army positioned behind a ceasefire line. Yeah. 
The rebels were mostly Tutsis, an ethnic minority that had been persecuted for decades. Some of us had been refugees since 1959. Uh, and over the years, in the early 60s, in the 70s, there had been killings of Tutsis in different parts of Rwanda. Uh, so we mainly focused on the very fact that there was need for change in the country and that uh, these stateless people, ourselves, were everywhere in the neighboring countries and beyond, needed to come back home. The rebel threat had heightened tensions between Tutsis and the ethnic majority, the Hutus. The Hutus had ruled since independence from Belgium in the early 60s. Under the UN-backed peace accord, the Hutus would be forced to share power with the Tutsi rebels. But the peace process was already faltering, even as General Dallaire set up his command center in a rundown Kigali hotel. With only 2,500 lightly armed troops, he was ill-prepared to enforce a fragile peace in a country he did not understand. We had very, very little information, knowledge of the background to Rwanda, its history, its culture, the, you know, what had taken place in the country since independence or even before independence, and especially even in the last couple of years. So we went in quite blind. From the moment he arrived, someone was testing Dallaire's ability to keep the peace. There were mysterious riots and assassinations. And, and also, we were already getting all these stories about a third force, you know, of squadrons of, of uh, killers. And we couldn't confirm anything. We were just getting all that, you know, as rumors, innuendos, and we couldn't cross-check the damn stuff because I was not allowed to have an intelligence capability. So all that sort of sort of came as a, as a dark cloud. Ultimately, I, I, I felt we could do it. But that is a, a bravado, I think, also from my part. Nothing was going to stop me. Bit of innocence in there, eh? Then, from inside the third force, an informant emerged. The informant revealed that a secretive group of Hutu extremists was plotting to derail the peace agreement and exterminate their enemies. And he was uh, within the uh, higher structures of the MNND party, which was the hardline party of the president. He said that he, he simply wasn't going to continue to work in that atmosphere, that they were undermining the whole process, uh, and they were ultimately planning uh, the evilest of deeds of, of uh, uh, attacking not only Tutsis, but all the moderate Hutu leaders also. The informant was a trainer for the Interra Humway, a paramilitary youth movement. He said they were planning to kill some of Dallaire's troops, Belgian soldiers, the backbone of the peacekeeping force. Jean-Pierre, the informant, said they, they felt that if the Belgians were killed, that Belgium and the UN would pack up and leave. Um, so already the, the situation was changing that somebody didn't want us there and that they were going to target us to, to encourage us to go. In an urgent cable to the UN leadership, Dallaire repeated the informant's warnings that there was a plan to exterminate all Tutsis in Kigali, that Belgian peacekeepers would also be killed in the belief that Belgium would then withdraw all its troops. Dallaire told New York he was going to raid the militia's arms caches. He signed off in his native French 
Where there's a will, there's a way. Let's go. I sent that and then, uh, I went to bed and probably slept one of the best nights I had because I felt that finally we were going to, we were going to take a certain level of control that would permit us to do so much more. The cable arrived in New York at the UN's peacekeeping department, then run by Kofi Annan. And the fax uh, came in, and uh, uh, General Dale had also been in touch on the phone with General uh, Baril. Uh, and in fact, he has sent other messages where he sometimes is questioned that the, somebody came and gave me this information. I don't know how, how sincere it is, whether I'm being manipulated or not, because intelligence can also be used to manipulate you. Hanan was skeptical. In his response, he ordered Dallaire first not to take any action, and second, to share the informant's secrets with the Rwandan government, which he knew had strong ties to the Hutu extremists. Why did we go that route? Uh, often sharing, shining light on these things and telling those planning it at the governmental level that the international community knows what is being planned. We are monitoring, we are going to deal uh, with you harshly and we know what you are up to. Sometimes it's a very good deterrent. Anand told Dallaire he was not to raid the arms caches and he must avoid any action that might cause UN troops to use force. The big hammer at the end of the message uh, that came to me within hours of my sending my information message was stop decease and by the by you're totally outside of your mandate. At that time the whole philosophy was we don't want another Mogadishu and so keep it tight. Mogadishu. Three months earlier, when the Black Hawks were shot down in Somalia and 18 American soldiers died on a UN mission, it changed everything about Washington's commitment to peacekeeping, especially in Africa. The Clinton administration was brought to its knees by the, by the problem in Somalia. A secretary of defense was fired. A presidency was dramatically weakened. Uh, they were enormously criticized for this adventure in Somalia. And now you had another situation unfolding in, in Rwanda. And certainly no one was clamoring for a re-intervention into the heart of Africa. Despite the growing sense of danger, Kigali was teeming with thousands of Western expatriates. Diplomats, aid workers, and their families. The official line from the UN and all their embassies was that Rwanda was still safe. It was strange because on the one hand, here's um, little groups of eight UN soldiers fully decked out, you know, with all of their gear and their machine guns and everything, patrolling the city of eight, you know, and, and we used to joke, you can't, you can't spit without hitting a UN car. And so you got all this white vehicles, black UN all over them. And, and occasionally you would see some white tanks or something. There was an incredible sense of security in that. And yet we also knew things were going to blow. Hutu extremists were now confident the UN would not stand in their way. They imported thousands of machetes, prepared death lists, and began targeting their political opponents. It became simply a nightmare for the Tutsis, for all of the members of the opposition parties, even if they were Hutu. And we lived through a series of political assassinations almost on a daily basis. Every day, Every day God gave us, we had three, four, five dead bodies, people that we picked up on the streets every day. And people tried to tell us and tried to explain to us or help us understand, but we just, maybe we just didn't get it. 
it was just very hard to conceive of something so awful actually being meticulously planned and carried out. In central Kigali, a group of friends gathered for dinner at the home of a young American diplomat, Laura Lane. We had a couple friends over and um, you know, I just, we just sat down to dinner and all of a sudden there was a huge explosion. And I, I didn't instantly, you know, come to me what that was because I wasn't used to hearing those kinds of sounds. And then at 8.30, the first phone call came in saying that there, originally the first phone call said that there had been a big explosion in Kenombi Camp, which is just at the end of the runway of the airfield, the Kigali uh, airfield, um, saying that it looked like an ammunition dump had exploded. And it went from there's been a, an explosion at the airport to we think it's the ammunition dump at Kanambe that's blown up to it's a plane that's crashed to it's the presidential plane that's crashed. Someone had fired a missile that shot down the Hutu president's airplane. Even 10 years later, the responsibility for the attack remains a mystery. There are many theories as to who shot down the plane. I don't know if anybody has the answer to that. Was it Hutu extremists or was it Tutsi extremists? Was it done by the Tutsis as an excuse to, to begin uh, the movement south by the RPF and take control of the country? Uh, hard to say. Or was it used by the Hutu extremists to begin the genocide that, that took place? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. That night, UN commanders were summoned to a crisis meeting at Rwandan Army headquarters. We were heading through very darkened streets in Kigali, very quiet streets. There was no one. The streets were just empty. It was like a ghost town. They found a leading Hutu extremist, Colonel Theonest Bagasora, in control. Colonel Bagasora, who was the chef de cabinet, of the Minister of National Defense and, and a hardline person, in fact, uh, uh, considered even more than hardline. He was chairing the meeting. Bagasora had once vowed to launch an apocalypse against the Tutsis. Dallaire insisted he step aside and hand power to the moderate acting prime minister, Madame Agath. Dallaire knew she would resist the extremist's power grab and appeal for calm. Bagasora uh, kept saying that she is of no use. Uh, she never was able to garner her cabinet anyways. And uh, an officer that was sitting next to me stunk a booze. Um, uh, started swearing in French underneath his breath about her and calling her various names. and. Um, so we were stalemated. Dallaire asked UN headquarters for guidance. They responded by tightening his rules of engagement. He was ordered not to intervene, and above all, to avoid armed conflict. We were concerned, one, that uh, uh, Dallaire and his uh, force didn't have the capacity and didn't uh, to take on that sort of responsibility. And that if they attempted to do it and any of the peacekeepers were killed, we may see a repeat of uh, Somalia and we may not even be able to offer any assistance. You heard gunshots, you heard screams, you heard, you heard um, just so much activity that um, you knew this was going to be, you know, an awful night. And in, in the darkness, you were just, I, I remember feeling like, I don't want to, I don't want the daylight to come because I don't want to see knowing what I'm hearing. 
Well, what's going on here, huh? We got all the kids in the hallway and the television. This is April 7. It's about, it's about 6 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we were woken up at about 5.15, 5.20 um, by a lot of gunfire and stuff. Yeah, the killing was happening right there. Our kids were listening in We, while well, they're describing on the radio, and I'm talking back to them and saying how people are being killed in their front yard, and, and I'm saying we're trying to get help, and we're just trying to figure out what we can do. This whole drama's unfolding, and our kids are standing there glued to this thing, and all of a sudden I go, whoa, I see, you know, one of them standing there and just transfixed, and I say, Teresa, take them away. That morning, Dallaire sent Belgian and Ghanaian peacekeepers to guard Madame Agath, the moderate prime minister. Then he went to find the extremist leadership. Agath was getting all the, the protection she needed, uh, at least the, 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 we, we expected. We needed. I mean, they were, ended up by having 25 troops there. With that sort of in hand, my job now, because I was moving around, uh, is to go get a hold of Bagasora and say, well, okay, what's going on now? What is the situation? Roadblocks were coming up. Uh, but as I got closer to the inner core of the city, the roadblocks became more serious, and ultimately the roadblocks in that inner circle there was controlled by the presidential guard. And so uh, we made our way to the Ministry of Defense. Uh, nobody was there. Uh, and uh, so I said, well, maybe they're right back to where they were last night. So just turned and went towards the SM. As Dallaire looked for the extremist leaders, the prime minister's house was surrounded by Rwandan troops. Inside, UN peacekeepers sent to protect her were under orders not to use force. The prime minister called her neighbor, American diplomat Joyce Leader, about 8.30 in the morning, uh, she called and asked if she could come and hide in my house. The prime minister. The prime minister. And I didn't give it very much thought, and I said yes. But then when the Ghanaian peacekeeper who was guarding her um, he must have put a ladder up on her side of the fence, and he came up above the, he raised his head above the fence, and there were shots fired just then. Rwandan troops stormed the prime minister's compound. The peacekeepers radioed for instructions from Dallaire's Ghanaian deputy. We were in communication with them all along, and it was not even rational for them to try to oppose them. The best they could do was to talk to them, to negotiate, to tell them, look, what you're about to do is wrong. You cannot do it. At gunpoint, the UN troops surrendered their weapons to the Rwandans. The Ghanaian peacekeepers were soon released, but the 10 Belgian troops were taken hostage and led away. The radios became silent. Then you suspected something had gone wrong because communication was suddenly cut off. Then you sense a danger. Something must have happened. About an, another half hour later, we actually heard a scream and a shot and realized that it was the prime minister who had been found and killed. General Dallaire hadn't heard of the attack, but he'd learned the extremist leadership was meeting at army headquarters. As he approached, Dallaire caught a glimpse of his soldiers inside the army compound, lying in the dirt. And at the gate, as we went by, I saw two soldiers in a Belgian uniform lying on the ground about 50 odd meters inside, inside the camp. And so your whole life is dependent on those nanoseconds of taking that right decisions because it's life and death. 
I was already saying, I can't get those guys out of there. I just don't have the forces or the deployment capability. I've got so many other troops that I don't know of and all the vulnerability of the rest. I can't take these bastards on. To do anything for them and for the others, I had to negotiate. Dallaire carried on through the next gate to confront the extremist leadership. But he decided not to mention his troops, who he knew were being beaten 200 yards away. What I said was, get a grip of your units. I'm staying. The informant, Jean-Pierre, had told us that they were trying to set up to wipe out a dozen or so, or 10 Belgians, in order to break the back of our mission, because if the Belgians pulled out, I had no real substantive capability to sustain myself, and that the international community would pull us all out. These guys knew about Mogadishu also. And so uh, what I was making clear to them was is that I'm staying. Dallaire later demanded to know what had happened to the Belgians, but he took no military action to rescue his troops. Finally, uh, a phone call after insistence uh, came and said that they are all at the hospital, uh, at the morgue. And so I said, right, let's go. The morgue was a little shack uh, and a bit of an L-shaped small shack. And it was a 25-watt bulb at best. And there in the corner of the L-shape was this pile of potato bags. Just looked like a pile of potato, big, big, huge potato bags. And as we got closer, we, we saw that they were bodies. In the wake of Somalia, the murder of more Western peacekeepers triggered an immediate response. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I wanted to start with the situation in Rwanda. Uh, the president called the Secretary of State uh, this morning to express the, the president's concern about the safety of Americans in Rwanda uh, in light of the deteriorating situation there. By that morning, we kind of had a sense that we were not going to be able to wait this out. I took our wedding album, uh, we took our guns, and um, put the dog at our feet, and literally slumped down in the car and drove down the streets, like just looking over the dashboard, you know, as we hear fire in the background, and made it to the embassy. The Clinton administration ordered an immediate evacuation of all 257 U.S. citizens in Rwanda. It was up to Laura Lane to get every American out alive. We said we have to, you know, evacuate the American community out because we couldn't risk, you know, their lives um, trying to wait this out because if this was a plan, it had a larger purpose, and that larger purpose would not be good where you'd want anyone in harm's way. But Lane told Washington she wanted to stay and keep the embassy open as a safe haven for Rwandans. I felt very, very strongly that if there is someone who is planning this kind of evil, they need to know that there is also another group that we, the Americans, will stand right here and stand against them. And I felt very, very strongly about that because otherwise they think they could get away with it. Yeah, I, I do recall there, there was the, the notion that yes, maybe we could stay behind and maybe we could do something. But then you have to say, with what do you create a safe haven if the Belgian troops could not defend and protect um, the Prime Minister from a ruthless attack 
uh, what were unarmed Americans bearing a flag going to do? Maybe hopelessly naive. I mean, we are four people in an embassy and very small embassy community. But I don't know. I I think one person can make a difference. And maybe if we just saved one life, that was one life worth saving. Maybe we couldn't save everyone, but I would have rather stood there and said, and, and stayed and said, I am going to stay because it is worth that risk. So in the end, the decision was taken out of my hands. All embassies in Kigali closed. Aid workers and diplomats were ordered out of the country. We started going out, picking up our, our military observers who were in various locations, picking up our UN staff, picking up diplomats, um, picking up people at risk. And we started a whole series of, of what we call rescue missions to go pick people up, try to locate them. Beardsley went to rescue Polish Catholic priests trapped with two UN observers in a Kigali church where Tutsis had sought refuge. The uh, military observers and the priests could hear people screaming over the church, so they'd left their quarters and had come over to see what was going on. They were grabbed and they were put up against the wall with a rifle underneath their chin, and they were held there while the identity cards were, were captured and were burned. And then the militia came in and the gendarmes literally, the police literally handed them over to the, uh, to the militia, who then proceeded through the rest of the evening to, uh, to chop them apart with machetes. Inside the church itself um, were about 150 people. About 15 of them were still alive. The rest had been uh, attacked with machetes and had been killed. And, and the thing that stood out in my mind up until that day, it almost bore the resemblance of a coup, uh, taking out the moderates. But this was different. This, this, was, this was just ordinary men, women, and children. And the only reason whatsoever that they were killed and targeted was because they were Tutsi. Behind the ceasefire line, the Tutsi rebels of the Rwandan Patriotic Front were preparing to respond. The information very clearly came in very fast, showing how targeted killings were being carried out and how these were spreading out, not only in Kigali, but going beyond Kigali to other parts of the country. And we knew that was the usual style. The massacres had started. And we have to take action. The rebels declared the peace process dead and attacked the extremist government. General Kagame had gone through training at Fort Leavenworth. The U.S. military maintained contact and understood the rebel leaders' intentions. Uh, in retrospect, there was no chance, I think, that, that the RPF uh, was in any mood to, to negotiate right from the beginning. They wanted what? They wanted to take control of the country. They wanted to take over control politically, militarily. There was no way you're going to stop the RPF. There was no way that they were in the mood to negotiate once this all started. Overnight, 1,000 French and Belgian paratroopers had arrived without warning, seizing Kigali Airport. These troops were not under UN command. Their mission was solely to get the expatriates out. Dozens of journalists had arrived with the new troops. They traveled with Belgian soldiers to Kigali's psychiatric hospital, where the Western staff was trapped. On the way in, they drove past the Interra Hamway, waiting outside. Tutsis emerged from the hospital building, where they'd been hiding for three days. They said they were surrounded by the militias, that some of them had already been killed. 
Depuis trois jours, il y a déjà des cadavres là-dedans. When it was clear the soldiers weren't going to help, the refugees appealed to the journalists. It was a whole group of people, but in the whole group, one woman started to speak and started to explain why they were afraid and what was happening to them. And she started begging us to take her and the others with us. She was speaking to me, a woman to a woman, saying, I'm afraid, please help me. Yeah, we were just listening to her and then we couldn't do anything at that moment. We thought we couldn't do anything, just listen and say yes. So we left for the white people. It's over. But we knew the hundreds that stayed. And we heard the shooting at the moment we left. So it was clear for me that hell starts for them. All Western troops and UN peacekeepers were under orders not to evacuate ordinary Rwandans. What that meant was anybody that was white-skinned got to get on an airplane and fly to safety, and anybody that was black-skinned got to stay in Rwanda and get killed. And that's as simple as it came down to. It, it, it still to this day leaves a very, very bad taste in my mouth that the United States of America could have 350 Marines sitting at Bujumboro Airport, that the French were able to get in 500 or so uh, paratroopers, that the Belgians had over 1,000 paratroopers. Um, you know, we basically had our intervention force already on the ground. You know, what they later told us, it was impossible to get on the ground. We had it on the ground on the 10th of April, within three days of this thing starting. And, um, but it wasn't there to intervene. It wasn't there to save Rwandans. It was there to save white people. And that, that's what it came down to. With the airport taking fire, the American embassy decided to evacuate its staff and expatriates overland in convoys south to Burundi, where U.S. Marines were waiting. And there were people standing on either sides of the uh, road. And uh, it's my recollection that I saw some instruments like machetes in their hands. Um, and I remember thinking, well, they're just waiting for us to get out of here. And before they go on about their gruesome business. I was looking for the, the American embassy, basically. Uh, I saw them leaving. Uh, I saw the flags and the vehicles. I know all the vehicles, I know all the people they belong to, and so on. So I said, OK. Um, I, I think it was sad, surprising, to see that uh, by the end of the day, you are a person who, have, who has to die, when other people are allowed to be alive. This is a strange feeling. Americans were allowed to be alive. My neighbors were allowed to be alive. They were walking on the street. They were going to the market. And uh, we were here uh, feeling that we had to die anyway. As she organized the last American convoy, Laura Lane made a final attempt to do what she thought was right. We had we had a convoy of over 100 vehicles with over 600 people, only nine Americans. Greg and I were the last two. The ambassador was at the front. And yes, there were, there were Rwandans in there. There were Tutsis in there. And in some cases, there were Hutus. And so if they made it to our checkpoints and we, you know, we could hide them, we did. Some of them were, you know, we dubbed them Americans for the day. You know what I mean? We made them honorary Americans so that they could be in the convoy. Yeah. 
If people in Rwanda ever needed help, now was the time. And everybody's leaving. Carl Wilkins had put his family on an American convoy, but he decided to stay behind with Rwandan colleagues and workers who'd sought refuge in his home. That Tutsi young lady and that Tutsi young man were faces right there to me representing the country, and I felt if I left, they were going to be killed. And then, and then I recognized, you know, how is it? I've got, a, I got this blue American passport. That means I can go, but all of these people don't have a passport. They can't go. And, and, and while all of those things played in, the bottom line is it just seemed the right thing to do. By the evening of April 10th, Carl Wilkins was the only American left in Rwanda. As far as I know, everyone in Kigali who's wanted to leave has been able to leave and they're probably successfully out by now, safely out by now. Thanks for The Clinton administration breathed a sigh of relief. In Belgium, the country was in crisis. With 10 of its soldiers dead, the government wanted to pull all its peacekeepers out of Rwanda. But it didn't want to be embarrassed by leaving alone. The foreign minister called Secretary of State Warren Christopher. The, the reaction of the public opinion in, in, in Belgium was, was very strong. And uh, I may say there was unanimity in, in, our, in order to ask uh, to pull out uh, the troops after the killing. Warren Christopher uh, told me that uh, he understood uh, perfectly uh, why the Belgian government uh, took that decision. He confirmed that the preference of the Americans went to the, the withdrawal of the mini war. Quite clearly, the, the, the Belgians wanted to have a cover of um, having others leave as well, I think, uh, and we sort of, we did, we yielded to that request. Um, in retrospect, I wonder if that was the right thing to do. Christopher instructed Madeleine Albright, America's ambassador at the UN, to push for the withdrawal of the entire peacekeeping force. Uh, my instructions uh, were to uh, support full withdrawal. And uh, I listened to the discussion very carefully in the Security Council, and I could see that we, our position was wrong, um, and especially in listening to uh, the African delegate, uh, uh, Ambassador Gambari from Nigeria, was very moving on this. And I had the full backing of my colleagues to argue on the contrary, that we must forget about uh, uh, cutting and running, that it will be, it will be callous, uh, it will be contradictory to the spirit of the Charter, which says Security Council has a responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security everywhere in the world, including Africa. And I uh, asked my deputy to take my seat while I left and went out into the hall, into these phone booths, uh, and called Washington. And they said, well, no, we're worrying about this, and we, these are your instructions. And I, I actually screamed into the phone. I said, they're unacceptable. I want them changed. Albright's call was to Richard Clark, head of peacekeeping at the National Security Council. Clark declined to talk to Frontline, but he did talk to journalist Samantha Power. And they end up in a screaming match. The fight is not about whether to send U.S. troops to Rwanda. That's not even contemplated. The fight is simply about how to withdraw the U.N. peacekeepers and how many to withdraw and how many to leave in place and what the function of those peacekeepers should be who remain in place. That's what the fight is about. That's the extent of the dissent at the highest level of the U.S. government about 
this genocide. That's it. That phone call. With the United States demanding a withdrawal, the UN instructed General Dallaire to start closing down his peacekeeping mission. Dallaire turned to his deputy, General Henry Aniadojo, for advice. And I remember sitting in front of his desk, huge man sitting there, stoic. And I said, uh, Henry, they want us out. We failed in the mission. We failed in attempting to convince. We failed the Rwandans. We are going to uh, uh, run uh, and cut the losses. That's what they want us to do. And I said, no, we haven't failed. And as commanders, we are going to sit here, uh, sit here, work hard, and see to each solution. So let's tell the, those people back in New York that we do not think that the mission should be closed. Aniodoho assured Delaire his Ghanaian peacekeepers would stay. And that was all I needed. That meant that I would still have troops on the ground, which were good troops, not well equipped, but good troops. So I stood up and I said, Henry, we're not going to run. We're not going to abandon the mission. And we will not be held in history uh, of being accountable for the abandonment of the Rwandan people. It was just morally corrupt to do that. And that's when I went back and told him to go to hell. As the UN debated whether to keep a peacekeeping force in Kigali, the extremist Hutu leadership implemented the next phase of its plan, to spread the killing across the nation by exploiting Rwanda's culture of obedience. They told Hutus the Tutsi rebels were foreign invaders bent on turning them into slaves. Their propaganda reminded Hutus that the Tutsis had ruled them for centuries, often treating them with disdain. Tutsis used to abuse Hutus. For example, if a Tutsi chief wished to stand up from his chair, he would call up a Hutu, who would allow his foot to be pierced by the Tutsi's spear as he stood up. My understanding is that Tutsis are not originally from Rwanda. I heard that they might have come from Egypt or somewhere else. An extremist hate radio station told Hutus to eliminate their Tutsi neighbors. Then, when the war began, people changed. One day across the valley, we saw houses burning and people fleeing from their homes. A 12-year-old girl named Valentina followed her parents into the Catholic church in Nirabuye, where along with more than 5,000 other Tutsis, they waited. It was April the 15th. I was a young girl. My parents thought the church was safe because no one will be killed in the church. When we arrived, I could see the older people were very sad and upset. Everybody was scared, but nobody knew what was going to happen. The leader of the local community told us that Tutsis had fled to Nyarui and that we had to go there and kill them. On the morning of April 15th, we woke up and started walking towards the church. It was like going to the marketplace. I saw the soldiers come in and they started shooting and shooting. All we had to defend ourselves were rocks. 
Then our local governor, Gachumbitsi, came in and stood in front of us. Gachumbitsi said that everyone should know what they were there for. He said that all those who were there should be killed, that no one should survive. Then they started killing, hacking with their machetes. They kept doing it, and I was hiding under dead people. They didn't kill me because of the blood covering me. They thought they had killed me. It was as if we were taken over by Satan. When Satan is using you, you lose your mind. We were not ourselves. You couldn't be normal and you start butchering people for no reason. We had been attacked by the devil. It was very late, around 2 a.m. when the Inhera Humwe came back. One of them stepped on my head. He was shaking me with his foot to see if I was alive. He said, this thing is dead, and so they left. I lived among the dead for a long time. At night, the dogs would come to eat the bodies. Once the dog was eating someone next to me, I threw something at the dog and he ran away. I hid in a small room. That's where I stayed and slept for 43 days. As the Tutsi rebel army pushed south towards the capital, they found evidence of massacres in village after village. With the rebels approaching, extremist Hutus unleashed more in Terahamwe militias to accelerate the killing. The murdered prime minister had been replaced by Jean Kambanda, who incited followers to repulse the Tutsi rebels and their sympathizers, known as Inkotanyi. The Inkotanyi did not come to conquer power only. They are after you too. They want to kill you all. Guns are not only for soldiers. Every person can own a gun. If they shoot, you shoot back. I too carry one all the time. Here it is. Extremist Hutus referred to Tutsi survivors as those not finished off. The Red Cross had never left Rwanda, and those who stayed confronted a stark moral dilemma. What do you do in the face of evil? BBC reporter spoke to the Red Cross leader in Rwanda, Philippe Gaillard. Walking around here, it, it, the, the images are quite horrific. You've been dealing with this for a long time. What do you think of it? I don't know if I, st if I still feel something. I'm, I have a brain of iron. 
That's the way I survive. That's the way I can speak to you in a so clear language. Is there a high price to be paid for that kind of brain of iron? Later on, perhaps? Later on, maybe. For the time being, so far, so good. Soon after the killing began, Gaillard decided he had to challenge the extremist government. Rwandan troops had stopped a Red Cross ambulance and killed six patients. I decided to call my headquarters in Geneva to tell the story. And my counterpart in Geneva told me, do you think we could make it public? And, and then you think twice, I mean, because if you make it public, then you know that people who might kill you would really decide to kill you because of what you told. Huh? And it was a bit poker. We, we decided to do it. So following day, BBC, Reuters, Radio France Internationale, it was everywhere. The publicity embarrassed the extremists and their government gave the Red Cross safe passage throughout Rwanda. So these six people didn't die for, for nothing. I mean, they, they, because of their deaths, hundreds of other people could be saved. Gaillard cultivated a relationship with the extremist leadership, which he believes helped the Red Cross save 65,000 lives. When, when we talk about mass sailing, I think that's the best and the only way is to talk with the people who want to kill them. Yeah? I remember one day I met, by chance, Colonel Theonest Bagosora. And I told him, Colonel, do something to, to stop the killings. I mean, this is... This is absurd, I mean, this... This... This is suicide, I mean. And his answer was... There, there are words you'll never forget, you know. His answer was, listen to, sir, if I want, tomorrow, I can recruit 50,000 more in Teramwe. So... I took him by the shirt. I'm 58 kilograms and must be 115. No? So I took him by his shirt, looked his eyes, and told him, Theonest, you will lose the war. Gaillard's network of aid workers across Rwanda gave him the most accurate count of the death toll. He estimated that in the first two weeks, 100,000 Rwandans had been killed. The Red Cross has a tradition of neutrality and public silence, but Gaillard decided that this genocide would be different. The International Committee of the Red Cross, which is a 140 years old organization, was not active during the Armenian genocide, shut up during the Holocaust. Everybody knew what was happening with the Jews. In, in such circumstances, if, if you don't at least speak out clearly, and you, you are participating to, to the genocide. I mean, if you just shut up when you see what you see, I mean, morally, ethically, you cannot shut up. It's a responsibility to, to talk, to speak out, yeah?
a Rwandan human rights activist traveled to Washington. She'd been smuggled out of Kigali after a harrowing ordeal. Monique Mujawa Maria came to tell American officials what was happening in her country and ask for stronger U.S. action. The first person who I met when I arrived in the United States was Anthony Lake, who at the time was National Security Advisor. I will always remember him. He was very pleased to see me. Well, I met with Monique and was moved and terrified uh, for her by her story of barely escaping, uh, hiding in the attic for a while and then uh, getting out. I think he was personally affected by what was happening in Rwanda. But as a government official, he was not ready to take action. He didn't want to. And it's not that I didn't care. It's that any caring wasn't translated into any focus, any attention, really, on something like this. It would have taken quite a push. And there's no question in my mind that in the end, the president would have had to push it. A congressional official responsible for Africa gave me an explanation which was discouraging, but also enlightening. He said, listen, Monique, the United States has no friends. The United States has interests. And in the United States, there is no interest in Rwanda. And we are not interested in sending young American Marines to bring them back in coffins. We have no incentive. As Monique lobbied Washington, America and the entire UN Security Council voted to withdraw 90% of the peacekeepers in Rwanda. This was the compromise Madeleine Albright had argued for. At least a token force was allowed to remain. It was a, it was a very, very difficult time and the situation was unclear. You know, in retrospect, it all looks very clear, but when you were at the time, uh, when it was unclear about what was happening in Rwanda, uh, it was very clear that Congress was not supportive of additional peacekeepers, very clear that the Pentagon uh, was not interested in getting deeply involved. What was your gut feeling about the effectiveness of, the, of that force that was being left behind? Well, I think that my gut feeling was that it couldn't do what it had to do. It was like the world had disappeared out there. The world just didn't care. Uh, and it made no difference what you said or how you said it to them. We could have packed up dead bodies, put them on a herc, flown to New York, walked into the Security Council and dumped them on the floor in front of the Security Council. And all that would have happened was we would have been charged for illegally using a UN aircraft. Um, uh, they just didn't want to do anything. Forget any idea that somebody's going to come and, and help you, Delaire, or, or your forces, and that we're going to actually do something positive. We're just going to continue the movement that the Belgians have started of withdrawing and withdrawing and pulling out. That, that scenario brought an enormous bloom because there is no cavalry coming over the hill. General Dallaire was left in Kigali with only 450 ill-equipped troops from developing countries. Now he faced the moral burden of bearing witness to a genocide without the means to stop it. He was abandoned by his own organization. This is terrible. To be abandoned by his own organization, it's terrible. I was always supported. It's a big difference, a huge difference. We needed uh, surgeons 
nurses, I mean, this kind of very specialized stuff, you know. It arrived to Rwanda within days. It's very, very efficient, very short. They came. Some people had to be changed because some people got crazy. But then you find other people who, yeah, able to take risks and to, to do the very little things you can do, which are always miracles, do miracles. That's, yeah, in such context, it's the only way to do something, I guess. It's Monday, 25th of April. It's a rainy, cold day. Day before the beginning of the historic elections in, in South Africa, and rockets have just been flying over the house. Carl Wilkins, the only American not to evacuate from Rwanda, hadn't left his home in nearly three weeks. And so when I went out, it was, it was wild. There were horses roaming the streets, and there's no horses in Rwanda except at the Belgian club, and someone, I guess, had let them out of their stalls, and there were guys sitting at roadblocks in couches, you know, and, and they'd have an old shotgun across their lap, and they'd have like a monkey, you know, on a leash, some foreigner's pet who had fled. Little kids were playing with all kinds of Western toys all over the city. Little Rwandan kids had never seen these toys before, much less been able to touch them and play with them. Um, it was, it was a wild place out there. Chromo Alex, a veteran UN aid worker, volunteered to come back to Rwanda and set up a humanitarian team in Kigali. Very few people get opportunities to be real heroes. So I wanted to be one of those, you know, one of those few. During the genocide, what was the life right here? Uh, very dead quiet. Barriers on most of the, uh, almost any road entering into the, into the neighborhood was blocked off with uh, tree stumps or logs or beer cases. Each day, Gromo Alex delivered food to refugees at UN safe havens in the city and learned to navigate the Interahamwe roadblocks. Started as early as we could in the morning, not too early. We tried to finish it as early in the afternoon as possible because at by noon they had been drinking and were intoxicated. And they had either killed people and wanted to kill more, or they hadn't killed and they wanted to kill. Killing was like a drink that if you you took one drink, you wanted another one, and you wanted another. You wanted to become more and more intoxicated. Sometimes people kill once, and then to lessen the impact of that murder on their psyches or on their conscience, that they kill again, and then they kill again. And then each, each murder drives you to kill again, not so much that you forget that you've killed before, but that you've, you've killed, and it, it just becomes part of you and you've just got to kill and kill and kill. Four weeks into the genocide, the Red Cross estimated 300,000 Rwandans had been killed. I think the conscience of the world has grieved for the slaughter in Rwanda. But we also know from not only the Somali experience, but from what we read of the conflict between the Hutus and the Tutsis, that there is a political and military element to this. So I think we can take the lessons we learned and perhaps do a better job there. Uh, I think the problem here uh, for me, for the president, uh, for most of us at senior levels uh, was that it never became 
a serious issue. We never uh, came to grips with what in retrospect should have been a central issue of do we do much more to insist that the international community intervene and go out and find the troops that are necessary or even contemplate uh, an American intervention itself. Uh, that issue just never arose. The administration left Rwanda to the bureaucrats and an interagency working group led by the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Africa, Prudence Bushnell. I mean, what an extraordinary way to spend time. Hi, dear, I'm going off to the office today to sit with my people and talk about, is there any way we can save um, human beings from being slaughtered when there are no resources, and there's no peacekeeping, it was, uh, these were conversations I'll never, ever forget. Bushnell's hands were tied by the government's policy of non-intervention. So when she called extremist Hutu leaders, she could threaten them only with words. Um, I would set the alarm for two o'clock in the morning and having these bizarre conversations in French. Hello, this is our Prudence Bush now. Stop it. Stop killing people. When she called General Kagame, the Tutsi rebel leader, Bushnell's instructions were to demand that he halt his advance and negotiate with the extremists. He was always very dispassionate, but there was a burst in the middle of this conversation of a fair amount of passion when he said to me, Madam, they're killing my people. And it wasn't part of my instructions to be empathetic to, um, and yet it was, it really pulled at my heart because um, I knew they were killing his people. And uh, indeed I talked to Pro Bushnell and I hate remembering the conversation I had with her because uh, it always brings back those memories that while for us we are focusing on and seeing that hundreds of thousands of people are being killed. Somebody else was talking about something else that had nothing to do with saving the lives of these people who are being killed. Uh, the only effort I could make as a human being to sort of reach out a hand of humanity um, by saying, as I signed off, General, I wish you peace. And that's the way I ended my conversations with him. Um, it was awful. Excuse me. It was really difficult. As the outside world left Rwanda to its fate, one UN soldier in Kigali was taking matters into his own hands. Captain Mbai Jang of Senegal was an unarmed UN observer, renowned for his ability to charm his way past the killers. He was tall, tall guy. And he had the smile, he had a big toothy smile. Even in all this you know, gore and hatred, as long as you can have that brief glimpse of you know, a smile or something to laugh about that's good, you grab onto it. And with Mbai, I think that's what everybody did. At all those checkpoints, they all knew him. From the first hours of the genocide, Captain Mbai had ignored orders to remain neutral. He had rescued the children of Prime Minister Agath, hiding them in a closet 
while their mother was being killed. Based at the Hotel Milkolin, a safe haven in the center of Kigali, Captain Mbai was part of a group of UN observers whose very presence was often enough to keep the killers at bay. These guys didn't move. This, this heart of, of, of observers, the gang that stayed at the Minkodin, there were seven or eight of them. That particular group, on their own initiative, would go to places where people told there might be people hidden, and they would get them out and bring them to either Midkalin or another safe place that we had. And and Yang was one of those leaders in that. I mean, he was was evident, uh, courageous, and risk taking. But even General Dallaire didn't realize the full extent of Captain Mbai's secret rescue missions. We'd see in this back room in Amahoro Hotel. The headquarters. You know, large groups of people that you know, all of a sudden appeared and then the next day were gone. And we began to uh, put together that Mbai was bringing people from all over town to the headquarters and then evacuating them or having them picked up and taken to safety elsewhere. I knew what Mbai Dian was doing. I had a very, very strong uh, suspicion, put it that way, of what he was doing. And had I investigated, I could have found out, but I didn't want to find out. I didn't want to say there is a Senegalese officer saving people in this town. You can imagine what the impact of that would have been. He would have been killed. While observers like Captain Mbai were saving hundreds of lives, General Dallaire had a plan to save tens of thousands by creating more safe havens like the few his troops were already protecting in Kigali. Dallaire had a plan um, which was basically to secure football stadiums in every town <coughs> around Rwanda. Football stadiums were particularly de defendable areas because they had large concrete stands. Uh, and uh, if you have 50 soldiers with guns on the top of those stands, you can stop people coming in to kill people, basically. So it was, I think it was very doable if there had been a much uh, bigger UN, not that much bigger, a few, a few thousand well-armed UN soldiers. General, you do say that people are being killed, uh, taken out of front in Cap Guy. What can the UN do about it? Well, send me troops. Will you send a troop? Well, what more do you want me to say? I'm waiting here. So send me troops. But the UN Security Council was skeptical. Yeah, we knew what Dallaire was saying, but remember, the Belgians, which were the primary Western European force, had left. And there weren't many other European forces that had real capacity raising their hand up in the air, volunteering to put battalions on the ground in Rwanda. It just didn't exist. American officials worried that UN troops would get embroiled in Rwanda's civil war because the Tutsi rebels of the Rwanda Patriotic Front made it clear they would oppose a robust UN force. At the time, the RPF was determined to take Kigali, take power back in Kigali, and they weren't interested in the UN coming back in. They saw a UN force as being a force that would prop up the Hutu regime that was committing the very atrocities that were ongoing. So the RPF was not interested in a UN force, and this was crucial to our decision-making regarding whether a force would go in and whether it would go into Kigali. The UN told Dallaire he would get no more troops. And without a larger force, all he could do was to keep trying to negotiate a ceasefire between the Tutsi rebels and the Hutu government. I was also uh, determined to continue to keep negotiations going because maybe it'll stop. Maybe with the, a ceasefire, you know, between the two belligerents, we might be able to stop the massacre. When the ceasefire talks again went nowhere, 
Delaire asked to meet directly with the commanders of the death squads. I had to crack the nut of the militias. And so I asked Bagasar, I said, listen, let me meet these guys. Let me negotiate with them. Inside a Kigali hotel, the leaders of the Interahamwe were waiting. And so when I arrived, uh, Pagasaur introduced them. Uh, and as I was looking at them and shaking their hands, uh, I noticed some blood spots still on them. And all of a sudden, they didn't... They disappeared from being human. All of a sudden, something happened that turned them into non-human things. And I was not talking with humans. I literally was talking with evil. It even became a very difficult ethical problem. Do I actually negotiate with the devil to save people? Or do I wipe it out? I shoot the bastards right there. I haven't answered that question yet. The Interahamwe continued to threaten UN safe havens like Saint Fami Church in Kigali. The Tutsi refugees inside suspected the Hutu priest was helping the killers. They appealed to Delaire. There were like two Senegalese military who were coming from time to time. And they said, we, if they stay here permanently, we will be more or less protected because, you know, people did not want to kill and have uh, and being seen, especially by the international community, journalists and so on. Delaire placed the church under UN guard. As elsewhere, sometimes all he had to offer was a couple of unarmed UN soldiers. Quite amazingly, these people who were very brave, managed here and at the ICRC hospital to prevent armed people from coming in saying, stop, you're not allowed in here. This, is, this site is protected by the UN. And, he, and you ask yourself, well, here's one guy with no gun, sitting on a wooden chair all day, and you're, you know, all night, you know, not sleeping. And he's able, with no gun, to convince people that they're not allowed in here to kill people. I mean, there were some powerful, brave things that were being done by UN soldiers, completely devoid of any support from New York. Forget it, I'm sorry, nothing came from those people. Everybody knew every day live what was happening in this country. You could follow that every day on TV, on radio. Who moved? Nobody. nobody. Yeah. I spoke to the Red Cross representative and I asked him how many people had been killed. And the, Philippe said something along the lines of, in the first few weeks, I said that 100,000 people had been killed. A few weeks later, I said loud and clear that I think half a million people have been killed. And now you're another journalist, and you're asking me again. And I'm telling you, I can't count anymore. Half a million people have been killed, and I've stopped counting. They 
cannot tell us or tell me that they didn't know. They were told every day what was happening there. So don't, don't come back to me and tell me, I'm sorry, we didn't know. No, 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 no. Everybody knew. After the Holocaust, the world said never again and adopted a UN convention requiring that future genocides be stopped. When genocide happened in Rwanda, the United States, along with most other governments, simply avoided using the word. Comment on that or a view uh, as to whether or not what is happening could be genocide? Well, as I think you know, the, the use of the term genocide has a, a very precise uh, legal meaning, although it's not uh, strictly a, a, a legal determination. There are, there are other factors in there as well. Um, when in, in looking at a situation to make a determination about that, uh, before we, we begin to use that term, uh, we have to know so, uh, as much as possible about the, the facts of the situation. Out of curiosity, given that some, so many people say that there is genocide uh, underway or something that strongly resembles it, why wouldn't this convention be Well, I think, as you know, this, this becomes a legal definitional thing, unfortunately, in terms of uh, as horrendous as all these things are, there becomes a definitional question. At the time, it, I, I have to make so clear to you that at the time, people just did not have the sense that this was happening in the proportions that it was. And by the time that it uh, happened, you couldn't do anything about it. Six weeks into the genocide, the Security Council finally changed course and authorized over 5,000 more peacekeepers for Rwanda but none were immediately available. The UN doesn't have any troops. We borrowed them from governments. And I recall on the Rwanda, then uh, we approached about 80 governments trying to get office of troops, and they wouldn't uh, give them to us. Washington promised logistical support. But as bodies flowed out of Rwanda down the rivers of Central Africa, State Department officials struggled to get the Pentagon to act. At one point, I had recommended that in response to the hate propaganda radio, known as Radio Milkoline, that the US could use military uh, radio jamming equipment to block those radio transmissions, to take them off the air effectively. One lawyer uh, from the Pentagon uh, made the argument that that would be contrary to the U.S. constitutional protection of freedom of the press, freedom of speech. Truly atrocious that we weren't able to do something because of some, some legal nicety about um, international radio conventions. And then the APC thing as sort of as emblematic, symptomatic. Washington had agreed to send 50 armored personnel carriers to the UN peacekeepers, but they would take three months to arrive. Why, because we, we spent so much time wrangling about you know, who was gonna pay for them, who was gonna pay for refurbishing them, who was gonna transport them, who was gonna pay for the transport, who was gonna pay for the training of the Ghanaians so that they could use them. I mean, and again, it's, it's sort of bureaucracy at its, at its very worst. And, and, uh, but we couldn't, at our level, you know, there was, we couldn't break through that. Somebody else would have had to intervene to say, this is nonsense, get on with it, do it. The bureaucratic paralysis emerged from the administration's decision not to intervene. Seven weeks into the genocide, President Clinton restated his policy that the U.S. would intervene in a humanitarian crisis only if it were in America's national interest. 
The end of the superpower standoff lifted the lid from a cauldron of long simmering hatreds. Now the entire global terrain is bloody with such conflicts from Rwanda to Georgia. Whether we get involved in any of the world's ethnic conflicts in the end must depend on the cumulative weight of the American interests at stake. The one American to stay in Kigali when the embassy closed probably saved more lives during the genocide than the entire U.S. government. Carl Wilkins discovered the Interra Humway had surrounded an orphanage. One day as we brought a, a load of water to them, this counselor, local counselor from the area comes ripping in in his, in his little stolen Mercedes station wagon. And um, I, as he got out of his car, um, I looked around and here surrounding the orphanage, just materializing, it's like about 50 militia guys, camo jackets or camo pants, but all of them with machine guns. And I said to my Rwandan colleague who was driving the truck, I said, siphon as slow as you can. We got to make this last. I don't know what we're going to do, but it seems like they're not coming while we're here. While his colleagues stayed at the orphanage, Wilkins went to the local government headquarters looking for help. And a young secretary I'd become friends with, he says, the prime minister's here. And I'm like, so what's that mean? And he's like, ask him. And I'm like, ask him? You know, it's like that's the stupidest thing you could imagine, to ask this guy who is obviously orchestrating the genocide, a key player, and, and yet I had no other options. And door opens, everybody snaps to attention, and here comes Kabanda and, and his group. A little entourage, and they're coming down the hall, and I'm, you know, and, and and I stand up and I put my hand out and I said, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm Carl Wilkins, the director of ADRA, and and he stops and he looks at me and then he takes my hand and shakes it, and he said, Yeah, I've heard about you and your work. How, how is it? And I said, Well, honestly, sir, it's not very good right now. The orphans at Kasimba are surrounded, and I think there's going to be a massacre if there hasn't been already. Just tell them, you know. And uh, he turns around, talks to some of his aides or whatever. He says, we're aware of the situation, and, and uh, those orphans are going to be safe. Um, I'll see to it. The orphans were saved. Years later, Prime Minister Kambanda would be convicted of genocide by a UN tribunal. You know, the genocide is so complicated. <sighs> I was in so many positions that could have been interpreted as compromising or even collaborating with the enemy, huh? You know, who's going to believe someone who goes to court and says, well, actually, I asked Kabanda to help me save some Tutsis, huh? Who's going to believe that? The stuff in a genocide just turns, and that's why, you know, the thing about this is, is we got to recognize in each one of us. There's such a potential for good, and there's such a potential for evil. By late May, the extremists were running out of Tutsis to kill. They threatened to storm the UN sanctuary at the Hotel Milkolin. Captain Mbai Jang of Senegal led 600 Tutsis to a safer part of town. And uh, the militia attacked the convoys. And I, I saw individual soldiers, including um, Captain Bai Jiang, actually kicking people off because they didn't have guns. The UN soldiers didn't have guns. They were actually kicking people off and saying, you can't come up here. These people, we're saving these people. A few days later, Captain Mbai was driving from the hotel back to UN headquarters. He stopped at this bridge, a final checkpoint. The mortar had landed behind his car and shrapnel came through the back window and in the back of his head. And apparently killed him instantly. They're calling around for a body bag 
and there's no body bags. There's not a body bag. And there's nothing left, and there's nothing. And you, you wonder, you know, you know, at this time we're starting to put it together and we're saying, you know, here's a here's a guy who gave his ultimate, who did everything, and we don't even have a body bag, you know. But I think to you know, show him some respect. We had some UNICEF plastic sheeting, and we had some tape. You know, we're folding them up, and uh, you know, the creases aren't right, you know, because his feet are so damn big. You know, and you don't want that for him. You want it to be like, you know, just laid out perfectly so that, you know, when people look at him, they, you know, they, they know that he was something great. <laughs> No one knows how many lives Captain Mbai Jang personally saved. At least a hundred, perhaps a thousand. Captain Mbai Jang is one of the best officers in my army. And uh, the job he done here, none of, none of us did it. I remember bursting into tears with a, a colleague of his, the Senegalese captain. And um, the captain said to me, you're a journalist, I'm a soldier. Now, I, you've got to d tell the world what Mbaidian did. You've got to tell the, the people that he saved lots of lives. Even while the UN was shamefully pulling out its troops, you know, he was saving people's lives. And, and uh, please tell the world. We carried the stretcher uh, into the Hercules aircraft. It was a very, very low point. Very low point. Such an incredibly courageous individual, amongst others, who were strong and courageous. But he seemed to be uh, untouchable. As the civil war in Rwanda was drawing to a close, the BBC's Fergal Keen was traveling with the advancing Tutsi rebels. One evening in late May, they approached the church at Niarabuye, where more than 5,000 Tutsis had sought refuge. got out of the car. And um, in front of the church, there were some bodies on the ground. You find yourself walking along, and you're stepping around and stepping over bodies. And then we walk down this path through the church compound, and it was heavily overgrown, heavily overgrown. And we went down further until we came to this kind of open courtyard area, where the bodies were stacked in against the walls. And it started to get dark, and then we went into the church, and there was no light in the church itself. You're walking around the dark, and you suddenly the light points here, and you see a kid's body. And you know it's a kid because he's wearing his khaki school uniform. And he's lying there, and his head's been bludgeoned away. Then down in another corner, there's a man's body lying there. As we're coming out, we hear noises, or noises from one of the rooms. And I get very, very scared. And one of the drivers with us, a Ugandan, said, don't worry, it's only rats rats and, um, and we left and I just remember looking up and at the church itself and there's this white statue of Christ standing with his arms open and then as you look down from him there's the remains of a, a human body underneath and, um, and I was you know I was raised as a Catholic 
and I kind of drifted away big time from religion. But I really, I, I prayed so hard. And I said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us thy kingdom come. I needed to believe in something. I think going to Nyarubuye, seeing what had happened there a few weeks earlier, and coming face to face with a human capacity for evil on a scale I just hadn't imagined. You can imagine it in your mind, hmm? but until you experience it and smell it, until you walk there, then that, that, that changes you. But I don't welcome the fact that I was changed. We heard that there were survivors and we got to the mayor's offices, the offices that had been used by the man accused of leading the genocide. And we walked in and sitting on the ground where this woman and I think two children, and one of the children, she looked in the most terrible state. She, um, we could see that her hand was black, being hacked away. And there was a wound on the back of her head as well. The nurse was you know, trying, to, trying to dress the wounds and she just, this child looked. I looked at that kid and I said, she's not gonna make it. You know, there's no way. The kid's name was Valentina. I felt a lot of pain, a lot of pain, because my fingers had been chopped off and my head had been cut. I was very sad because my family was all dead. I didn't think I was going to survive. We have every reason to believe that acts of genocide have occurred. How many acts of genocide does it take? to make genocide? Um, Alan, that's just not a question that I'm in a position to answer. True that, the, that you have specific guidance not to use the word genocide in isolation, but always to preface it with this, uh, with this word acts of? Um, I have guidance which, uh, which to which I, uh, which I try to use as best as I can. Um, I'm not, uh, I, I have, uh, there are, are formulations that we are using that we are trying to be consistent in our use of. Um, I don't have a, an, an absolute uh, categorical uh, prescription against something, but I have the, the, the definitions, I have phraseology which is it, it is ludicrous um, in retrospect. Um, that the discussion was about, well, how what might we be viewed if we declared that there is genocide and then we are not in a position or not ready or willing or able to do anything about it. The fact of the matter is it was there, and the fact that we didn't say so was already tarnishing our credibility and our, and our capacity to do something about it. So. But I think, I mean, I, as I said, I think that's probably one of the most shameful passages in this uh, and this whole uh, exercise was our, the length of time and the amount of tortured discussion it took us to, to actually come to that determination. The Rwandan genocide came to an end in July 1994. It had lasted 100 days and ended only when the Tutsi rebels won the civil war. Hutu extremists had killed over 800,000 people as the world stood by. When I'd lay down at night in the hallway there, there was a hope that something's gonna happen, you know? S something's gotta happen. This thing didn't end in a couple days like we thought it did. It didn't end in a week or two like we thought it would. Somebody's gonna do something.
by the time the genocide was over, I was so angry at America. America the beautiful, America the brave. I was angry with our government. I was angry with people who could do something, even the simplest things, and they didn't. As the years passed, world leaders who did little as genocide happened on their watch came to places like Niarabuye on pilgrimages of contrition. At what point did I start saying to myself, we should have done more? When did that start coming to me? Honestly, it didn't start happening probably until I went to Rwanda, uh, saw the bodies. It was worse than anything I had seen in Vietnam. Uh, and after that, uh, I began understanding, or at least asking myself whether we, uh, whether we couldn't have done more. I think going to Rwanda was one of the biggest shocks for me. I went to um, this this church uh, on um, Lake, and uh, um, then there was a mass grave, and there was a small skeleton that they had managed to excavate, which was about the size of my grandchild at that time, and just and you could see the machete mark on the skull. I wish that I had pushed for a large humanitarian intervention. People would have thought I was crazy. It would never have happened, but I would have felt better about my own role in this. It was a very painful and traumatic uh, experience for me personally. And I think in some way for the, for the United Nations, it's not something that you, you forget. If we were to be confronted with a new Rwanda, is the world ready to do it? Would the world move in to stop it? And my answer is, I really don't know. I wish I can say yes. But I'm not convinced that we will see the kind of political will and the action required uh, to stop it. Eventually, President Clinton himself came to Rwanda. I have come today to pay the respects of my nation to all who suffered and all who perished in the Rwandan genocide. It may seem strange to you here, especially the many of you who lost members of your family, but all over the world there were people like me sitting in offices day after day after day, who did not fully appreciate the depth and the speed with which you were being engulfed by this unimaginable terror. In his remarks, which were billed as an apology, Clinton did say the U.S. had made mistakes. But he never actually said he was sorry. He met with survivors, and heard the human consequences of his policy of non-intervention. And then he left. Mr. President, the lack of intervention in Rwanda, um, can you tell us why the U.S. didn't intervene? I think that the people that were bringing these decisions to me felt that the Congress was still reeling from what had happened in Somalia. And by the time they finally, you know, I sort of started focusing on this and seeing the news reports coming out of it, uh, it was too late to do anything about it. And I feel terrible about it, because I think we could have sent five, 10,000 troops there and saved a couple hundred thousand lives. I think we could have saved about half of them. Uh, but I, I will always regret that Rwanda thing. I will always feel terrible about it. I, I came back uh, with, and still live with uh, this enormous guilt 
you know, I became, uh, fell, started falling into these depressions and, and it's like a spiral. And so I'd find uh, scotch mostly and I'd just drink myself and drink and then I'd, you know, cut myself or try to jump off things because the, the pain of killing yourself is nothing compared to the pain of living with this. I was the commander, my mission failed, and uh, hundreds of thousands of people died. And that uh, I can't find any solace in statements like I did my best. The commander can't use that as a reference in any operation. He succeeds or he fails. And then he stands by and to be accused of and to be held accountable for. And my mission failed. And that's that. And I don't feel guilty. I never felt guilty. Dagger felt guilty all the time. And I think this is the reason why he's still deeply wounded while my scars are, are okay. And when we came back from Rwanda with my wife, we were deliber deliberately, we had no, no children. And it was so evident for her, for me, that after this experience, uh, yeah, we both wanted to create life. I mean, I had never explained to my son that he was a product of the genocide. It's not easy to explain. <laughs> he is. Yeah. Nothing else, Greg. There's more to explore about this powerful human story at Frontline's website. And rockets have just been flying over the Video house. diaries of those few who tried to save lives. Read Frontline's interviews with the key decision makers in the UN and the US government, as well as with diplomats, journalists, and aid workers. A report on a new world standard on the responsibility to protect. And the progress of the International Criminal Tribunal. And much more at pbs.org. Support for Frontline is provided by U.S. News and World Report 